Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Scottish Drugs Forum webinar. I'm Dave Little, CEO of SDF, and I'll be chairing today's session, which will run until 2.20. This is the third in a series of webinars focusing on the medication assisted treatment standards from one to 10. The aim of the webinars are threefold. Firstly, to continue to raise awareness of the standards. Secondly, to highlight emerging good practice. And thirdly, to highlight challenges that remain with full implementation and how these may be addressed. Today, we'll be focusing on MAT standard three. A link to the full standards will be provided in the chat. So MAT standard three. All people at high risk of drug-related harm are proactively identified and offered support to commence or continue medication-assisted treatment. We will start with some short inputs from people with living experience, which have been presented at previous SDF webinars. This will be followed by three presentations. Jackie Aindo, Service Manager, Drug and Alcohol Services, NHS, Dumfries and Galloway. Trish Tracy, Head of Alcohol and Drugs, at Turning Point Scotland, and Claire Hughes, Senior Service Manager at Transform Forth Valley. Presentations will be followed by a question and answer session and a panel discussion. You can submit questions throughout the webinar through the Q&A tab on your toolbar. My colleague, Katie McLeod, will be monitoring questions as they come in and will be joining us for the Q&A and summarize the questions that have been asked. So let's get started with the perspective of people with living experience. Thank you. I was reasonably lucky. I had a great key worker who phoned me every week just to make sure things were okay and how my mood was and blah, blah, blah. And that doesn't happen often enough now. That one phone call could save their life one phone call or one text even just to let that person know that they, they are getting thought about because i know that i looked forward to them phone calls when we were in lockdown um my key worker was amazing and would have done anything for me through lockdown so i know that that could be done i personally benefited from getting contacted every week in some form. Uh, my preference would have been to go in and have an appointment, but it didn't even matter what stage I was at. If I got contacted every week, I, I seemed to respect respect the sort of service more or, or value the service more or, or, or maybe give more of myself over, you know what I mean, to my recovery sort of thing. I don't know. I, I just felt more involved. And obviously it saves, it will save lives as well for anybody who's sort of um, went back the way or, or, or started um, using again or is in a difficult situation, maybe life-threatening. That call could maybe save their life or get them some support that they really need at that point. So... Uh, it's a, it's a great idea for me, definitely. Well, that's just a very brief introduction to, to the standard. Um, we're now going to go on to our first speaker, who's uh, Jackie from Dumfries and Galloway. Over to you, Jackie. Thanks. Thanks. So um, we just wanted to give you a brief overview of uh, our assertive outreach service that we have in uh, Dumfries and Galloway. And it's really, it's a joint service that's done collaboratively between the NHS Addiction Service and We Are With You. Next slide, please, Andrew. So the main aims for this service were to improve quality of life um, for those most at risk within the area. So those most at risk of drug related death or non-fatal overdose. And just generally to provide more support, advice and guidance for um, those individuals and to try and improve access and engagement of those individuals with uh, mainstream services and also to retain um, individuals within uh, the different services. So whether that was we or with you or the mainstream addiction service. Next slide, please. So the background for the service it started really in July 2020, and that was in response to us noticing an increase in drug-related deaths and non-fatal overdoses within the area. 
Um, and initially we were only taking referrals for opiate drug uh, ref uh, use. Um, and we had initial funding through the alcohol and drug partnership for two years. So the service was um, started provisionally with just two team leaders, one from We Are With You and one from the NHS, and then it expanded to have two We Are With You community navigators. And the referrals came uh, originally from the emergency department that were notified to the alcohol and drug partnership. So next slide, please. Over the last sort of year and a half, that's been expanded to include police concern uh, referrals and also referrals from the Specialist Drug and Alcohol Service and the Drug and Alcohol Liaison staff um, at our local hospital. Um, and we also um, have started taking referrals from the Scottish Ambulance Service, um, and in particular for those people refusing to attend the emergency department after non fatal overdoses. Um, because we had such a good uptake to this service, the ADP then agreed to fund two more nurses and a further two community navigators. And we then realized that there's probably a need for us to look at uh, in increasing the referrals to other drug uses, for example, benzodiazepines. We do get some, um, what we would perhaps call inappropriate notifications. So that might be non-fatal overdoses that are re related to um, sort of intentional overdose, uh, perhaps paracetamol uh, in conjunction with alcohol or with people who've got significant mental health issues. And we do still capture those and we just make sure that we pass them on to the relevant services. So that could be the crisis team or the community mental health team. We also went through all the non-fatal overdose notifications for the last five years, capturing those that were thought to be at the highest risk and making sure that we uh, linked in with any services that we're currently involved with and also with the GPs as well. We did bespoke uh, violence and aggression training for the assertive outreach staff as it was thought to be uh, possibly a, a quite high risk service going into people's homes where there perhaps wasn't a uh, knowledge of uh, risk associated with individual people. And we circulated posters to GP practices and community pharmacies. And that was really in relation to um, more specifically the We Are With You workers being identified as being part of this service um, if they were going in asking whether somebody had seen um, uh, an individual or not. Next slide, please. So our criteria for this service at the moment is anyone aged 18 or over who's had a non-fatal overdose involving opiates or benzodiazepines. Any new prison liberations are seen by the assertive outreach service, uh, stabilised on the medication before they're transferred to the mainstream drug and alcohol service. Um, they also take high-risk patients known to the specialist drug and alcohol service or we are with you who've disengaged from service or treatment. Um, and any high risk service users from We Are With You or Alcohol and Drug Support Southwest Scotland. Um, for the high risk uh, service users within the specialist drug and alcohol service, uh, they tend to be the ones that have got increasing chaotic uh, polydrug use, frequent non attendance at the first assessment, a recent discharge from hospital, or those that have had decreased engagement with the um, SDAS name nurse and those with deteriorating mental or physical health related to drug use, where we've had a police concern form raised, where somebody might be homeless or living alone, or they're frequently missing uh, opiate substitution treatment doses. Next slide, please. So this is our current team at the moment. Um, we've got team leader, Stephen Norman from We Are With You, and unfortunately, Stephen wasn't able to make it today to do this presentation jointly with me. Um, and then the remainder of the team from We Are With You. And then we've got Kate Marr, who is the team leader for the Specialist Drug and Alcohol Service and three, three nurses that work uh, within the NHS. So all of, all of these staff make up our assertive outreach um, team. Um, you can see a, a, a copy of the poster that we, we give out to the GP pharmacies. It's in need of updating, I'm afraid, because we have a few, few more names to add on to that poster at the moment. Uh, next page, please. So what does our assertive outreach uh, service do? Um, we try and have a very much a plis, uh, holistic approach to what we provide to uh, individuals, and that's really tailored to their uh, drug use and to their individual needs. 
So it can be overdose awareness and harm reduction, naloxone training, um, accompany, accompanying them to appointments, starting or restarting opiate substitution treatment, bloodborne virus testing, vaccination, injecting site assessment, wound management advice, injecting equipment provision, food parcel provision, help with utilities, linking in with housing associations, physical and mental health support, linking in with social services, referral to advocacy services, and uh, you know, um, requesting police welfare checks where it's required. Next slide, please. So for our assertive outreach input, we aim to see the service user within 24 hours of referral, and it's a maximum of 72 hours if it's over the weekend. Currently, the service doesn't work uh, weekends. There's no time constraint of involvement, so it could be a week or it could be six months. It's really dependent on that individual. Um, and the aim is to move to that individual to mainstream services as and when we are able to do that um, in conjunction with the, with the person and try and reduce risk. There can be multiple contacts per week and there's a combination of face-to-face -face or telephone contacts uh, to enable us to do that. And um, there's very much joint work with mainstream services uh, between the Specialist Drug and Alcohol Service and We Are With You. When we look at discharge from assertive outreach, um, we can look at either discharging directly from them or transferring to another service or back to um, the Specialist Drug and Alcohol Service. And that's usually done in agreement jointly between the service user, the assertive outreach worker and any other staff involved with, with the service user at that time. And it's a minimum of two attempts to contact with at least 24 hours between contacts. If a service user declines support, then contacts made five to seven days later for a further attempt to engage with them. Next slide, please. So as I've mentioned before, it's very much um, a model of partnership working. Um, our uh, NHS and We Are With You staff meet daily to discuss any new referrals or ongoing cases that they've got. Um, and. Uh, just look at sort of the progress that's being made with those service users and any decisions on who will see any new referrals. We have a quarterly assertive outreach steering group uh, that's attended by the Alcohol and Drug Partnership and quarterly team leaders catch up to discuss progress changes and any training requirements uh, for, for the teams. Next slide please. In terms of clinical governance, we do a six monthly audit to look at referral rates and sources, the drug trends, response rates, periods of involvement, regional data and further overdoses, etc. And we have developed uh, key performance indicators for the assertive outreach service. Um, there are six monthly reports to the alcohol and drug partnership and the service user and staff experiential questionnaires that are undertaken. And at the bottom there, there's just a few sort of examples of some of the feedback that we've had from service users and from staff. Next slide, please. So there has been some challenges and there still is some challenges really when we're, we're trying to run this service. So the main one has been the different documentation and risk assessment systems by each of the uh, agencies involved. Um, and trying to sort of overcome that. And unfortunately, there, there does end up being some duplication as a result of that. But we're actively trying to, um, to resolve that at the moment. We have much the same as I would imagine many other services within Scotland at the moment have problems with recruitment. And we did have posts uh, that were empty, specifically more so on the NHS side for a number of months. But thankfully, we've now recruited to all of those. One of the other difficulties has been having non-medical prescribing input. Um, and again, um, unfortunately, the, with us recruiting recently, we are still going to have to train staff up to do non-medical prescribing. Um, another issue has been having direct access to mental health services. Um, so there's a lot of work going on within um, the team and also within both we are with you and the specialist drug and alcohol service to look at how we can combat that. And uh, probably the final issue is we recognise that, you know, it would be really good to be able to provide a seven day assertive outreach cover. Um, and as I said before, it's currently Monday to Friday, 9am till 5pm. Next slide, please. So moving forward, what we're looking to achieve is a single point access documentation system. 
We want to expand criteria to include other sub substances, for example, cocaine, alcohol, gabapentinoids, and open up referral sources to include community pharmacies, CMHT, social services, and primary care. We are looking at amalgamating our drug and alcohol liaison service with the assertive outreach staff from the NHS perspective, and that hopefully will allow us to provide seven day cover, um, especially if we can get um, support from We Are With You with regards to that. And we're looking at developing a pathway for direct access to mental health services and hopefully having co-location where the staff can meet together rather than working in, in the separate areas. I think that's that's me. Thanks so much, uh, Jackie. That That's a, a great uh, description of your service and the currently how it operates and what you'd like to do in the future. Um, if you have any questions to any of the speakers, please use the uh, Q. Can I now ask uh, Trish Tracy from the Turning Point Scotland to present? Thanks, Trish. I'm going to tell you about the test of change that was funded through the Drug Death Task Force in CORA, um, the overdose response teams. The test for change started in November 2020 um, in Glasgow City, and that then um, stopped operating in Glasgow in March 2022. There was a, another service put in place then. Um, it also expanded into North and South Lanarkshire, Renfrewshire, East Renfrewshire, East and Western Barnsham and Berkeley, so the Greater Glasgow area except for Glasgow City. And the funding is currently in place until February 2022. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk to you about the aim of the response, how it operates, and we've had some independent evaluation. Um, so I'm going to apologise in advance for stealing some of the slides of the independent evaluation um, interim report. Um, and I'm going to, I'll explain that to you about how, how that's operated. Um, what the achievements and some quotes from service users, the recommendations from that evaluation. Thank you. Next slide. The aim of the response was to just reduce and prevent drug related deaths caused by fatal overdose. So it was very much um, targeted people who were having um, near fatal overdoses. That's now changed, and it changes in some areas to be people at risk as well of, of a near fatal overdose. To provide that rapid response within 24 to 48 hours, to give a short focus period of support, contacting people through a set of outreach, but maybe not staying with, with them for a long period of time, working with them to get them linked into the rest of the, the system or their services to support them. We want to improve access and engagement with other, with other services. Targeting people in their local community and also trying to improve information sharing and understanding the, the barriers to that and, and work to try and, and find ways that we can make that better to, to reach people quicker. Next slide, please. The service operates from 10 in the morning to 10 at night, seven days per week. We were flexible with this um, to look at whether they would be, need to be later in the evening. And currently that's that's the hours that seem to be working quite well. Staff work in pairs, um, obviously they have a light on their phone and, and they go and outreach to people in their communities. Try and call the person, but if they don't get them, they, they'll still go out and outreach them. And yet that would be at their home, at known places, and just different places they'll try and get to get to. We take multiple attempts to reach a person. And just keep doing that for a good number of weeks and maybe try and contact people that know them as well to try to get them. We we'll also work with whoever's present, those are the family member there, we we'll work with them as well. Um, we we'll work within that box to get the right support at the right time for individuals. The team have a harm reduction kit with them as well, so they can do IEP or naloxone training. They we'll also have um, sanitary products, anything other sort of thing that might be helpful for the person at that time. As a, as a voluntary sector organisation, we don't get direct information from the Scottish Ambulance Service. That will go to our NHS partners. And that's done differently in different areas about how we get that information. In some areas, that's a huddle. Some it's secure email. Other people, it's via the phone. So it's quite different across all the different ADP areas that we're working on. We also have a free phone number as well, so that people can phone in direct. And we find 
Police Scotland and Scottish Ambulance Service with the person's consent can call if they're not going with the ambulance. That can get that information much quicker to us. But we've also had family members and people that um, whose friends have overdosed going directly to the line as well. The information that we ask for is very basic. Um, a, a, a telephone number and an address. So we take more information for persons who have but we wouldn't use that as a barrier to still try to reach the person. Next slide, please. The independent evaluation we commissioned Indigo House um, to evaluate the, the, the scene to the response. And there was an interim report in May 2022. And we're just a wee bit earlier in this um, webinar. The, the report will be available next month. Um, it was a mixed method approach. We looked at all the data that the team were um, collecting, also had qualitative interviews with individuals that had received the response and their family members and also partners through both surveys and follow-up interviews. There was also some workshops with staff um, to get their views on how it was operating and what the barriers were as well. Next slide, please. The achievements that came out from the independent evaluation was that there was a high level of reach. There was a lot of success in getting people, and this was something that we said to a lot that wouldn't happen, um, that we wouldn't be able to get people, and we found that persistence, um, and that is certainly which we really did way to get people. Our response time at the time of the, the, the interim report um, was 0 0.6 days in Lanarkshire and 2 to 3 days. Glasgow and Greater Glasgow and Clyde. The response, the response time obviously it has been changing back and forward, but at that time it was that we seem to have got a much quicker response now. However, information sharing can cause that information to be quite slow to get to us, um, which can, can mean it can be longer than we would like. The other achievement was our hour support that was really valued by people that were using the response and, and other people in the recovery communities and services within the areas, families and stakeholders. I think in a lot of areas that we operate, um, there wasn't, there's not a lot of provision about our support. Um, so that was really seen as an addition. And in Lanarkshire, we had really good success at getting bills in from hospital. And, we, and one of our, um, that was a really good achievement. We'd like to see that replicated. Hopefully we'll see some changes in that in the, full, the final report that comes out next month. Also, a not some training and supply, harm reduction interventions and advice. Again, in some areas, there was not a lot of naloxone actually being issued, the people being trained. So that really made a big difference to that area. And there's a lot of feedback about that being supportive for individuals. We often find people weren't accessing services, they knew, they knew the service, and that just having somebody coming up to, the, to, to meet them and showing that they cared really seemed to make a difference in, in seeing them reconnecting again. One of the other things that came back through the, through the feedback was that the system was more aware in their fatal overdose and how to respond. And we, through the relationship we made with the different partners, people were responding quicker to us and quicker for the individual, which is obviously what we all want to achieve. Found some workarounds for data sharing, as I say, with the telephone um, number and just that determination and belief from all the different partners. We now have information sharing agreement in uh, Lanarkshire. And that we hope that that will make a big difference because that just came in last week. We've not had any complaints for service users um, or for family members at all. Um, and that was something that people were quite concerned about when we started. Getting people on, onto, over, um, onto MAT was variable depending on the area that we were operating in. We obviously operated over a, a large number of ADPs. In Glasgow City, um, that was really good, um, particularly with relationships. It could be the same day or when it suited the person made a day or two. In Renfrewshire, again, with relationships, um, that really helped to get an, an individual started as well. And there's a test of change in Western Barnes and Clyde Bank. Um, and that's, that's um, people can get same day access there, so that's really helpful for the team as well. Next slide, please. Lots of really valuable um, feedback. These were some of the ones that the researchers picked, um, and I thought I would share that with you. Um, 
some so some of the things where we know that there are people out there who are living who are having overdoses and we're not finding out about them because the information sharing is not happening. And there's been a lot of improvements since the time of this report, but it's still not there yet, and particularly because we as a volunteer great partner. Again, from an individual, the big thing for me is that they came out to me, listened to me, and they were helping me to fight the fear that I'm not alone. They came to me. See, that, that's repeated that coming to me. You know, a lot of people are scared to go out, so they came to me. There should be more of this for people. I think we need to get out onto the streets and help people. And this, that, there was a number of quotes like that. These are things that tend to be themes, and also been out in the evening. And the weekend seem to be really valuable by people. Addiction services need to go open seven days a week and be more assertive. That was a general con thing from somebody. They should not be asking people to come to them at a set time, a certain place. Services need to be more flexible and suit the patient's needs more. And there's also a comment, I think, from a partner about how it's fundamental that the Scottish Ambulance Service share the information straight with um, voluntary sector partners as well as the, the, the NHS because that can. So the information getting down there. Thank you. Next slide. And some recommendations um, for us. That was for us to where we were getting to be um, evaluated more. And this was about the resistance to the formal information sharing it should be broken. And we've worked really hard to try and do that. As I said, we have the Alliance sharing agreement now, but not got one in every area. Whether we should continue with that hospital. Good practice that we've seen in Lanarkshire, and we should try and move that across different areas. And just that we should keep away um, raising awareness of the project and work, working with our partners, which I think is what we have to do. So next slide, please. That's me. Thanks very much. From uh, Transform Fourth Valley, um, can I ask uh, you to come and speak, Claire? Thanks. Just put on the right screen now. So I'm Claire Hughes, I'm the Senior Service Manager at Transform Fourth Valley. We're a third sector organisation which has got many different funders from the Falkirk Health and Social Care Partnership, Falkirk Council itself, the Robertson's Trust and the Cora Foundation. We used to be known as Signpost Recovery just before the lockdown in March 2020, we rebranded to be Transform Fourth Valley and in that we changed our core values and our mission statements and the work that we do. Our core values just now are compassion, inclusion, respect and partnership. Our mission statement is we are de dedicated to empowering individuals and families to live a more fulfilled life. We work with partners to actively challenge inequalities and to achieve sustainable change. We offer a wide range of services to support individuals and their families who are impacted by substance use and or societal, financial and health inequalities. We respond to identified need in Fourth Valley and in partnership we support individuals and families to tackle inequalities that diminish life chances. We consider the whole person building a firm foundation which an individual or family can, can achieve positive and lasting change. Fourth Valley, for people who don't know, it's quite a large geographical area and it's got three local authorities in it. Falkirk Council, Clitmanishire Council and Stirling Council and the one NHS board, um, NHS Fourth Valley. So we've got all the different local authorities to work with within each area. So the service for today we're going to speak about is there a certain outreach service? And that is open for individuals over the age of 16, their families and the local community experiencing any challenges from substance use, anything as well that revolts to substance misuse harm, uh, financial, societal, or in relation to their health and wellbeing. We work with individuals with a wide range of complex issues and often unstable lifestyles who are either not able to get involved with services or find it difficult to maintain in mainstream services, they're in and out of services quite frequently. At a third about each service, we go to people, we don't expect them to come to us. We go to people's individual homes, other hostels, or wherever it is that they're staying, if that's suitable. We do community drop-ins with partners, street patrols, or we use a mobile outreach vehicle. The mobile IEP has just started again. We used to do that um, during the pandemic, and then it stopped. And we've just got a test of change that started last week, and that's until July 2023. For the mobile IEP, we're doing it to home visits. So we get into people's homes to look at IEP. We'll also do a full range of interventions, our site checks, wound first aid, the air tool. We'll also look at their, their wider needs, their housing, have they got utilities, have they got food? What's their finances? What's their income? Do they need any support with it? 
Are they in services just now? Would they like to be in another service? Can we refer them into it or help them maintain to be in that service? If people are already in MAT, well, if they need any support to maintain it, we'll also offer that as well and referrals into any other services. Out with the IEP, also the referrals we receive, we'll look at financial support, housing support, BBV test and the locks on training. A lot of our referrals do come from Scotland, a lot of the VPDs, the concern reports. Um, our aim is well, we do them three days a week, a Monday, Wednesday and Friday, and they see people within 72 hours of the incident. We do a lot of community events with partners, and that can be a lot of awareness raising, whether it's in person um, and social media. We also provide a lot of family support as well. If the families, not a lot of people we work with do have a lot of families that are with them, but if they do have them, we'll also offer families and work with Scottish families affected by alcohol and drugs. The outcomes that we're looking for is ask people to access new IEP services um, and support peer distribution. In Forth Valley, this is the first mobile service again since last year. There hasn't been anything there. And as you've seen from the map, it's a very large geographical area and a lot of our rural areas don't have any IEP at all. So part of the test of change we're doing is working in more of the rural communities. We're looking at building relationships with people in services, referring people into MAT or supporting them to sustain the MAT that they're already on, to help individuals develop the skills and confidence that are needed to support recovery. We work well with a recovery community and we've got one recovery worker from a local recovery community that's seconded over on a five-day week basis, one of our teams. An increase in engagement with services and community supports so it's not just substance use, it's looking at what else is available in their local community that people could get involved in. We look at identifying the barriers, identifying and reducing the barriers to support treatment or support. And we found that helps a lot with us going to the people to find out what it is that's reducing them from not getting into the services. An increase in attention, retention of accommodation. Also within Transform, we've got a lot of other teams. And we've got Housing First team and some of our other services. So we're looking to help support people out with the addiction set of the a set of outreach service. Promote community safety and wellbeing, and ultimately to prevent drugs-related deaths and incidences of near fatal overdoses, working assertively in the community. And definitely be us going to people, it does help. We find a lot of unmet needs and a lot of hidden harm in people's houses. A lot of people that have never been known to services or have been to services in the past but not been for a long time, we find them within these properties. And that's the main bit about our assertive outreach service. Um, a lot of the other parts of the services we do in Transform support people after they've been to our outreach service if they want to maintain longer term within treatment service before treatment services um, or further support to get into the services. We'll do that as well. Great, thanks very much, Claire. If you, if you want to stay on, on camera and if I can ask everyone else to, to uh, come back and my uh, colleague, Katie. But yeah, a couple of questions that have come up, um, uh, you know, kind of um, while we've been talking as well. So, so one of the first ones was around how challenging is it to get same day prescribing for people that need it, um, and what are the barriers? And um, so that's the first question. Okay, thanks. We'll, we'll take that first. J Jackie, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, um, it has been incredibly challenging. Um, previously, we did have one nurse that was an unmedical prescriber. Unfortunately, she left. And as I say, we've recruited two new nurses in now, both neither of whom are non-medical prescribers. So it does create a challenge for us. It does mean at the moment that if we're looking to restart patients on treatment or start them on treatment from fresh, those patients have got to be brought up to the mainstream service to see somebody um, to get started on treatment. So our hope is that uh, over the next sort of 12 months or six months rather, that we'll try and get both the new nurses um, onto the non-medical prescribing course to try and sort of address that. And obviously that will be so much of, the, of an issue then. Okay, thanks Jackie. Claire. For our service, we don't do any prescribing. Uh, we would refer into the Community Alcohol and Drug Partnership. And then Fourth Valley, it's just been piloted in the Stirling area, the same day prescribing. Okay, and, and that is that possible for, for people you refer in to, to, to receive that? Yes. Yeah, but not in the other two local authority no. areas? At no. present. And it's just the pilot area just now as okay. well. Thanks. Okay, thanks. And Trish, you, you mentioned that in your presentation that that was happening in certain areas. Yeah, happening in certain areas, I think, because of relationships, um, and I'm moving towards that anyway. Um, I was in Glasgow and in Renfrewshire, 
um, and with pests of change. So if you're within that pest of change area in Claybank, then you can access it there as well. So the others, though, they're still quite a length of wait. Okay, thanks. Uh, back to Katie. Okay. Um, so yeah, another question we had was around how, how straightforward is it to share information? So I know um, Trish highlighted some of the, the, the challenges and the resistance that can happen. So how straightforward is it to share information on aspects such as near fatal overdoses between agencies? Trish, do you want to start with that one because of the, the issues around particularly the third sector gaining access to, to um, Scottish Ambulance Service data, etc.? Yeah, Scottish Ambulance Service um, data doesn't come direct to, to the third sector, so that'll go to our NHS partners, be processed and then sent over to us. So that obviously gives a delay, um, which then, you know, delays the time that we can get to individuals. Information sharing is really frustrating. Um, I need to say I've been involved in this for a good couple of years now, and it's different in different areas. There's no national approach. Um, we find that we can get people uh, Renfrewshire, for example, is a great example of a good, of a, of a good information sharing agreement that all partners sign up to and get involved in. But we, even when we send copies of that to people, we don't necessarily get that replicated um, across different areas. And what we've found is when, when we can get permission from individuals, their relationships with partners are really key in, in, in that trusting relationship. And often that's not always the case for the first sector, you're not always trusted. Um, or the professional approaches and all those trusted, and that really came out in our evaluation report. So it's kind of two things, the way partnerships are key to information sharing as well as the formal information sharing agreements. Yeah, thanks, thanks Trish. And and Jackie, obviously your service is a partnership with uh, We Are With You. Have you had similar issues around data sharing? Uh, we did initially when we very first set this up, but I, I guess the different we're perhaps in a slightly better position than than um, Claire and, and Trish in that we only have one ADP and it is only the two services that are involved. Uh, we are with you and the mainstream drug and alcohol service. So we have a, a, an information sharing um, agreement with the Scottish Ambulance Service and with our emergency department. Um, all the referrals come through to our alcohol and drug partnership and we only have the one as I said so and they put on a spreadsheet and then they come through every morning they come through and they come through to the huddle to the certified outreach huddle so both sets of staff from NHS and we are with you sit in on that huddle and have access to that information then uh, through through that so information sharing for us at the moment is, isn't an issue for us. Okay thanks Jackie. Claire, Claire, I know it, your, your service operates a bit differently, but do you want to, anything to add to that? Yeah, it's just a bit different. We've got two ADPs and three local authorities uh, within Forth Valley, and each one's different. Um, some, Not everybody's in the same information chain, so some people you can get more access to, and as Trish said, a lot of it's down to relationships. When the person gives consent and permission, it makes it much easier as well, but we can do that way. Regarding the NFO stuff, that's from SAS, but that goes to NHS and CGL in the area. So we don't access that. A lot of it's through word of mouth. Or if the NFO nurse um, refers a person into us within the 24 hours that she sees them, we find out that way. OK, thanks. Thanks, Claire. Katie? Yeah, and just, just off the back of that question, we've just kind of had a, a related question just about um, any sort of insights from the panel about um, which service has taken the lead in developing the information sharing policy or how that's worked for you, if you could say something about that. Thank you. Jackie, do you want to answer that first yeah i would say it was very much the our alcohol and drug partnership that took the lead in in doing the work around the information sharing specifically with the scottish ambulance service and with the emergency department um so they, they did most of the footwork the legwork really around that and the agreements it did take especially with the scottish ambulance service i think it took approximately a year to kind of get that consent to kind of go through that trish Different in different areas, sorry, my same answer again. <laughs> um, different in different areas. We will send templates, we will help as much as we can um, to help people. Um, but yeah, it, does, it's, it tends to be different. And just, I didn't mention earlier, just the frustration thing is the same organisation you can have an information sharing with, like Police Scotland in one area, but no better in another. Um, it's just things that don't seem to make sense, um, even though when the will within the organisation is there to get the information sharing. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And Claire? 
because we're third sector as well, a lot of it's different. We used to have more information sharing when we used to prescribe that when we rebranded to be transform, we stopped the prescribing part, that went to another ADP part of the service. So again, the ISA is all changed. And just said before, it can be, it's individual services and not every service, as Trish said, has got the same, through the same department. Yep. So you need a different one for each department as well. Okay, thanks. Uh, Katie? Yeah, and we, ha we have another question, and I'm going to presume that this is in the context of um, same day prescribing um, and, and maybe accessible through assertive outreach, but um, the, the question is around checks that are done um, to prevent renal liver injuries when prescribing um, medication assisted treatment. Okay, I think I'll direct that to, to Jackie, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, Jackie. But... Uh, all right. Uh... Yeah, I mean, normally you would kind of do those checks, but um, we, we do try and start patients on same day treatment if we can and do send the checks off at the same time to, to kind of do that. Um, so far, we, we haven't had any issues with this, but it is really about trying to sort of be opportunistic and get people on treatment. Um, a lot of the time we, we do check, we do check uh, the nurses have all got sort of uh, iPads and laptops and iPhones so they are able to check on the system to see if any bloods have been done recently um, and they are able to take bloods and get them sent off um, that, that day so usually the results are back fairly quickly either that same day or the day after to do that sometimes it's all not even though you would like to try and get patients on treatment that same day you can't um, it depends on what they've taken that day etc so sometimes it's a case of going back the following day then and um, trying to start them on treatment the following day. Okay, thanks, thanks, Jackie. I think that covers that uh, question. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and then the next question is just um, sort of referring to the sort of change in drug trends um, that are around and, and particularly asking about su su successful approaches to engaging um, non-opiate users. Claire, do you want to go first? Uh, we have quite a lot of alcohol users as well, um, not as many as our drug users, but the alcohol users, we are, as an ADP, we were meeting this, at, uh, this week to look at, because a lot of the mats all towards drugs, and there is a whole population. A lot of the time, the alcohol users we get, they're already dependent, and they're problematic. So we are looking at further ways with other partners, how we can access people that are still managing their lifestyle just now, but alcohol is just starting to become problematic, but not a huge issue. So that's work that we're still ongoing just now. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Claire. Trish? The majority of the people we work with have had a near fatal overdose, so we just we get the people who have had that come through is um, a lot of benzodiazepines and a lot of follow drug use. So uh, I think, uh, I suppose a bit of that question is, is around, you know, is the assertive outreach model helping us in terms of gathering information on new trends, if you like, you know, quicker than we might otherwise get them? Do you, do you want to come back on that point, Trish? Is that your experience or not really? I think whatever we see, we can feed back in. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not entirely sure um, if it is, but certainly it seems to be the same. Like the, the increase in benzodiazepines seems to be a big thing that we're seeing. We've not really seen anything new that I can think of at the moment. Um, yeah. But I would say that if there was something, then, yeah, we would pick it up. Okay, well, and what, what about changes in benzo use as such? Would that be something that you might pick up yeah. in, in terms of the different benzos? Yeah, it would be if that if it was a if the person had an overdose was using benzo then yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we can certainly have systems to keep that back information back in when we see new things. Jackie, do you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, just agree with with Trish. Really, uh, we do sometimes find out uh, about different drugs that are being taken as a result of the assertive outreach uh, staff going out and seeing patients, and we recognise, you know, um, I think we've recognised fairly quickly that it isn't just a case of looking at opiate near fatal opiate overdoses. That benzodiazepines are playing a big part at the moment, as is alcohol. Um, and we are also seeing gabapentinoids as well included in the mix as well. And cocaine is another big factor for us as well. So I think it's, you know, the scope is there for assertive outreach really to start to include a lot of the other polydrug use and not just specifically around opiates. And you were saying, Jackie, that, that, that you would hope to do that within your, your service going forward? 
Yeah, the, the biggest barrier to that has been our staffing situation, really, and the difficulty in recruiting. Um, once we, we have the, the current staff sort of in post, and we've managed to kind of get them up to speed with everything, because there's a period of induction, obviously, required for these staff, we are we are hoping to look at sort of increasing that that range of drugs that we would start to look at within the service. Thanks very much, uh, Katie. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I guess the other part of that question was were there particular successful approaches to to um, that wider sort of group that we were speaking about that might not be using opiates as well. I, I, I guess. It, it, you know, my, my sense, I guess, from the services is, is that actually, you know, it's quite narrowly focused apart from um, Transform looking at uh, opiate overdoses. Would that be right, Trish? Looking at whatever's in the overdose, and there's usually opiates. Sometimes it's just benzodiazepines, but I don't think we're quite reaching the other groups, um, Katie, that you're talking about. I think, mm -hmm. yeah, as Jackie has said, you know, people with cocaine, it's and all the other gabapentins, everything that's near that polar dog uses, I think, the overdoses that we've seen. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and Claire? Yeah, yeah. Cocaine's a big thing that we've got just now as well. Um, because we don't get to see the NFO things, a lot of it's just when the workers make the referrals in, so we get to know what drugs is there. Often the person telling themselves what they think they're buying, but what is shown up in their system, or what we can send off to Wedinos, the lab, to see what it is they think they're buying, what their effects are compared to what, what is actually in the drug. So that, that's pretty good having that service. Okay, yeah, thanks. One of the questions that, that I had from your presentations was a, around the proportion of people that actually you're able to make contact with from the referrals. Um, Trish, do you want to go first? You, you've, you've probably got that data and it's just, I suppose it's just you know, and obviously that partly depends on your level of resource. I, I, I get that, but but have you got a sense of what that looks like? I don't have the data in front of me because it, things are, are obviously changing and we're waiting for that second report coming out. But when we did the first report, that was very high, um, was, we, which I think was quite a surprise. Um, we also found that when we went to somebody's door, that they wanted to see us. Um, and again, again, I think that was a surprise for for others as well and I think we, the staff felt quite apprehensive at first um, but the more, they, the more they got that positive response then, then the better that was you know the more confident they were at the other so I would say I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to quote a number because yeah. it keeps changing but I, I yeah. think it's higher than you would expect. Okay so you, you're higher than 50% anyway certainly? Yeah I was, yeah probably maybe yeah. the 8% okay. I think. Yeah, yeah. okay and uh, Jackie? Yeah, uh, I think the same for us, uh, Dave. I would say it's definitely more than 50%. I couldn't give you the exact figures at the moment. Um, I would say the same, that, you know, um, the response has been very positive to, to that. We don't get a lot of people declining um, input from assertive outreach. I think that's down to some of the persistence, really, from the staff and the ways that they're able to make contacts. And it's not just a case of telephoning and, you know, waiting for somebody to kind of get back to you about it, that it, it is that very much that proactive approach, really, and going and chapping on doors and, and things like that. OK, Thank, thanks very much. Uh, Katie. OK, so, yeah, we have another question just about how a set of outreach services um, it can sort of integrate with mainstream services. So, you know, obviously not all mainstream services will have an outreach approach um, and so that people will maybe need to attend set appointment times and venues. So the questions around do a set of outreach projects find people will follow up to those other external appointments? Trish, do you want to take that first? My opinion is there are quite a number of set of outreach services and they work better at engaging with people. Um, I think what you can do is that the set of outreach service can help get the person to the service. I think that helps rather than expect them just to go to the point in their So that doesn't always work. And obviously everybody's different and some individuals will, will do that. Um, but some people find it really difficult to get through that door. So I think having a work that go with them helps. Um, but the more set of outreach services, in my opinion, um, in my experience, is the, the better they are reaching people. Does that, does that raise questions about the other services and how they're operated as well, Trish? I suppose it's a day of resources, isn't it? 
you know, um, and we need, need more investment so that we can offer more self outreach. Um, and maybe it's also about uh, how, how we design our services and how we think about them as well. Yep. And particularly a set of values for people that are not engaging well and that we've not seen. Yep. Claire, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, again, it, it varies depending on which service they're going to. But a lot of the time, if we can actively go along with them or if we can phone the worker on their behalf if they give us permission to update on what their challenges and barriers might be. Why have they not been attending? What's difficult? Is it the clinic that they're going to? They don't like the building? Is it other people that say it? Is there stigma outside it? We found that helps really well. Because we, we are, there's not that many services in our areas as well. We get to, we tend to know a lot of the other workers. So that makes a huge difference. But definitely going to people's doors and going to them makes a huge, a huge difference. Yep, thanks, Claire. Jackie? Um, just echo the same, really. I, I think what happens sometimes with our services, if they're already in or have been known to the mainstream service and they've disengaged, then sometimes it's a, it, once they've had time to build that, up that rapport with the assertive outreach worker, um, they can look at sort of arranging a, whole, a joint home visit um, to see the person and just try and get that rapport build up again with the mainstream kind of worker. And sometimes that could be two or three uh, appointments at home the, um, not forcing the issue that you've got to actually physically attend an appointment at the mainstream service on your own. And it can be that bit about accompanying them as well to their appointment, especially the first one. Thanks, Jackie. Katie? Yeah, I guess just off the back of that as well, um, just thinking about, you know, obviously the flexibility of opening times that the assertive outreach teams have, you know, are there sort of peak times that you're noticing that actually mainstream services could learn from in terms of extending their hours? Because, you know, as we know, they, they often might be running until half past four or something like that. So I'm curious what the learning is from the assertive outreach work for times. Trish, I guess that's uh, probably to, to you really in terms of the fact that you did a 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. service. Yeah, um, weekends in particular. I think people want services at weekends because there's any other services there but um, definitely I, I can't really tell you where, where the trains are because I, I don't have that information in front of me but um, definitely evenings and weekends are definitely when we're up to actually some people have suggested that we should be, should be, should be open to later um, I'm not entirely sure about that you've got to think about safety but maybe if we had staff available maybe in um, hospitals that people could drop into or diff different areas maybe that would help um, but certainly there are others it does make a difference to people and I think it's just my experience is people don't tend to attend morning appointments anyway. So even just pushing that afternoon and evening, I think would, would, would be a good start towards engaging more people. Thanks, Trish. Uh, Jackie, I know you were wanting to extend the hours of your service. Have you, have you got any thoughts on that as well? Um, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, for us, I think at the moment, it's about looking at trying to provide a weekend kind of cover. Um, at the moment, our drug and alcohol liaison service kind of does a bit of um, not so much outreach, but the assertive kind of bit. They'll pick up the near fatal overdoses over the weekend. They're notified through the emergency department and they'll perhaps try and make contact with that person. But they're very much based in the hospital at that time. So unless the person comes up to the hospital, they, would, they, they wouldn't be able to go out and see them. So this is why we've we've started to look at amalgamating the drug and alcohol liaison service with assertive outreach, so that we will have a bigger staff cohort, if you like, that when it will enable us to cover seven days a week. Claire. Uh, yeah, we, we're only Monday to Friday as well, but definitely, I think the evenings we used to do back shifts before, and we're not doing that just now, but that definitely does help. As mornings, we've got a lot of missed appointments in the mornings, or not as many people come to any community events in the morning as well. So okay. more funding is required to go into even more evenings and weekends to get additional staff. And maybe linked to that is the, the issue of, uh, you know, dispersed rural communities as well. Claire, do you want to talk a bit about that from your perspective? How challenging is, is that? Yeah, because a lot of the rural areas, even from if we're in Alloa, it can take an over, as over an hour travelling by car to a certain area. So if somebody's using a bus, it can be several buses. It can take half a day to get to an appointment. So if they're limited on money, they're needing drugs or they're in withdrawals, that's not a, that's not a nice journey to make. 
So the more that we can go to these rural communities, but it's finding ways to go to the communities. It's not stigmatising for people as well, that people then don't feel that they're being they're being watched and people are noticing them. So it's getting that fine balance. But a lot of the time, the community police help us identify who people are and our biggest referrals and for the each service is Police Scotland because they're getting into a lot more houses that we're not seeing as well. Or they're seeing a lot more people that's maybe deteriorating a little bit or need a little bit more support or they know their family, their wider family. But that definitely helps for the rural communities. Yep. Okay. Thanks. And, and Jackie, obviously Dumfries and Galloway is, a, is even more rural. Yeah, we, we have exactly the same issues um, for our staff, you know, just going doing one or two appointments, it could be at either end of the uh, of the region. And you've lost a lot of sort of clinical time then with uh, due to traveling in between kind of spots. Um, so that, that is a, you know, that is one of the barriers, I think, or the, not so much a barrier, but a challenge really in, in running a certified outreach service is is having that capacity to cover, you know, large sort of rural areas. Thanks. Uh, Trish, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it affects response time, um, because if you're having to travel three hours, sometimes to get an individual, means you can't see as many individuals in a day. Um, I also think something that we really need to consider that's a, that, that this challenge for that is the cost of travelling. Obviously, Claire touched on for, for, for a service or an individual themselves, but also to run that service, um, the cost of petrol, I expect in staff are sometimes on more pay to be paying um, to run in their own cars. Um, you know, and that the cost of the very pair of the amount of miles, because the amount of miles that the teams are doing is an awful lot. Um, thousands of miles sometimes, you know, just going through maybe one area, the land shop to the other, or West and Barton shop to Ventish or something, you know. Yeah, we do need to consider that when we're designing these models as well and factor the time travel in so that we get better cover. Okay, no, that's that's helpful. Thanks. Uh, Katie. Okay, yeah, so if, if people are having any final questions, you've maybe got a few moments to, to pop them in, but um, we have uh, one at the moment um, that's around, um, basically, is it a difficult balance to deliver a sort of outreach whilst at the same time respecting people's right to privacy? Uh, Jackie, do you want to take that first? Yeah, I think it is incredibly difficult, isn't it? You know, it's it, it's it's um, the, the difficulty is not coming across as being sort of too pushy or you know um, invading somebody's personal space or you know uh, and, and that kind of thing really, um, and and not you know not appearing that you're kind of harassing them almost really to some extent. So I think we've got to be respectful of people if they if they don't want to engage with with services, you know. Um, and I think that's why we we do do a follow up call at five five to seven days later uh, with that person to just say, just checking in on you, everything okay? You know, have you changed your mind? No, you've not changed your mind, right? That's fine, you know. And we kind of leave it at that point then. Um, so because people do change their minds, so I think it's good to have that kind of back up and to go back and revisit that, but without pushing too much uh, on it. So it's a it's a fine balance, I think, to to kind of gauge that with that person. Okay, that, thanks, Jackie. Uh, Trish. Yeah, I agree about that balance, and I think it's also about the community that respects the other individuals don't know that somebody's getting a visit. So that's about being discreet about you know. So, but when you're in that area on the white, the clothes you're wearing or the way you're talking or whatever, you know, you no know, what about the clipboard, but you know, you're just trying to sort of blend in with the community and, and get that support and get back out again, I think, um, really makes a difference. Um, and with the individual, that is their choice. And it, what we've found is we ask them what they, you think, you see, you, what, what's the thing you want, rather than trying to offer them a range of services that we, that we feel we need. Um, and the same to find that that needs engagement there. So we might want to give them medication to treat his, um, assisted treatment. That might not be what their thing is. It might be their gift and their drug That's a priority. So we need to work with them and, and, and work yeah. to that plan. Yeah. And then maybe in time we can introduce other things. Yeah. And uh, Claire? Uh, just the same as other two have said as well, we are invited guests into people's house. So as respecting them for that and going at their pace and the IEP that we're delivering, it's to show that there's they don't just have to accept IEP for a certain length of time and then they must go into treatment services. If it's only IEP they want, then that, that's absolutely fine. It's their decision. 
and as utilities, the food, if they want housing repairs done, anything at all. If that's all they want, if that's enough for somebody in their life, then that's their decision, that's their life. And we can dip in and out as much as they like and whenever they like. Okay, so thanks Thanks very much. So the, I take it there's there's no more questions, Katie. We have, one, we have one more actually that's just come in. Um, so the, the, this, which might be our final question, um, the question is, does having children improve or reduce the chance of engagement? Claire. If someone has a child, then it is kind of saying, how often does a, is a child living with them all the time? Are they impacted by it? And Transform, we've also got a children and families team. Um, time for us and they will work with the children affected by parental substance use or whoever it is that their caregiver that's got substance use and they will give the child a one-to-one -one work as well. The adult can be supported along as, as well as the other teams for their substance use, other issues, the, law, the time for us team will look with them for their parenting skills, look at boundaries, routines, creating natural things within the household if the person's looking for that. But it won't stop a service getting involved with them. I suppose looking at it the other way around, though, Claire, you know, from, from, from the, the client. From the person's viewpoint, yeah. yeah. Sometimes we do find a lot of people don't want to tell us they've maybe got children or how much access they've got. And that's for us to try and make that a bit easier for the person to explain. Social work might need to know. They will need to know, depends on where they are. But it's not always a bad thing. Sometimes it's they do need additional support. And it's about us trying to explain what that support is and what that means to them in their life and be honest about it. And if we're going to any meetings with social work, we've already had that discussion with the person first. They know exactly what we're going to say, so it's not going to be a shock. Whether it's good, positive or not so positive, as long as we've had that discussion with the person beforehand, then there won't be any surprises on the day. Thanks, that's helpful. Uh, Jackie? Um, yeah, you know, it, it can. It can sometimes upset that kind of rapport, that relationship that you have with somebody when, when you go out to see them. Um, I think sometimes it can be the way it's discussed with the person, um, you know, and and your demeanour kind of when you when you're discussing that, and that it's more you, whatever you're doing is more of a supportive measure than a punitive measure because I think sometimes that's how it's perceived to be more punitive than than supportive. Um, that that said, sometimes people will just you know disengage at, at that point. You know, um, there is nothing you can do really with regards to that then other than trying to, to sort of talk to them and explain why it's important that we, we are doing what we're, we're trying to do. Um, but yeah, it can, it can impact on relationships and, and working with somebody. Thanks, Jackie. Trish, have you anything to add to that? I don't really think so. I think that was all covered other than maybe in the actual overdose response teams that we're only working with an individual once or twice on on harm reduction and really quite quick things and so sometimes that maybe would be affected if we don't do a full assessment and know all the circumstances. Yeah. Um yeah, so that, that may be just that short one one or two intervention it might not be affected just as much as it would be if we were working in a moment. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. We've uh... I suppose just really one final question that I had to each of you given that the you know part of the aim of the the webinar is to promote implementation of MAT Standard 3 um, and also highlight some of the challenges. If I can just ask the three of you in conclusion, what would be your message to other areas trying to, to set up similar service services um, in terms of maybe two or three key lessons that, that uh, you, you could suggest they should um, focus on? Claire, do you want to start with that? That's a big ask. <laughs> um, I think it's don't be afraid about doing outreach and it's it's not like you're you know, people will only let you in their property if they want you there. They will quite easily say no at the door. So it's not like you're encroaching on their time. But always be respectful. It's their property, it's their house, their belongings you're in. Um be there when you say you're going to be there. If you're going to be doing a drop in or you're doing an outreach or wherever you're going to be, if you've told people you'll be there then we need to commit to that. So, thanks very much. And uh Jackie. Uh, I think for me, it's just about good collaboration, um, really. And I think that's key to kind of breaking down some of the barriers um, that, that we see um, is being able to ensure that we've got good communication, we've got good collaboration with any any of the services. So that whether that's the people working within the assertive outreach service or the people that they sort of engage um, regularly with, like police, ambulance, social work, housing, etc. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Jackie. And 
Trish will, will give you the, the final word. <laughs> um, I would say similar, but I would say just do it, to be fair. Work the rest of it as you go. Um, we didn't have the information sharing, we still reach people. You know, it wasn't perfect, but we that collaboration and working with other people, the barriers can be overcome. Um, and individuals need, they need this response. It's really important that they get to individuals and that matters the most. Um, you can work with us, but you can get that as long as we keep staff safe and keep individuals safe. Um, we find workgrounds, it's amazing. The goodwill of everybody coming together, um, we're not determined for the same outcome to get to individuals. Okay, so thanks Thanks very much, uh, Trish, for, for that. For that. Uh, so uh, we'll draw the webinar to a close. Um, it has been recorded and an edited version will be published on the SDF YouTube channel as soon as possible. Uh, the MAT Standard 1 webinar was published this week and the MAT Standard 2 webinar will be published uh, this Monday. We will be sending out an evaluation shortly and it would be very helpful if you could complete that. As highlighted, this is the third in a series of webinars on MAT Standards implementation. The session on MAT Standard 4 will run at the same time next week. If you haven't yet booked for this session and would like to do so, uh, a link will be provided uh, in the evaluation email that will be sent out. Uh, so finally, I'd like to thank all of you for attending and a special thanks to today's presenters. I hope you found this session helpful, highlighting examples of progress made uh, with implementing MAT Standard 3, uh, the challenges that remain, and potential sh solutions to, to some of those challenges. Uh, thank you again and goodbye for now. Thanks. <laughs>